Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed the two videos so far on Aegon's Conquest. The whole idea of this final part is to take a much more relaxed approach to the discussion of the topic. So, like, go into more detail in areas I couldn't in the main video and elaborate on some things to hopefully give a bit more context, especially in areas where I had to make some cuts and kind of trim things down for the sake of the video, otherwise they would have been an hour long each. So the first thing I really want to talk about is Aenar and the Targaryen Exodus. It's still an area where very little is really known. I mean, the whole Doom of Valyria is still this very mysterious thing. No one really knows what caused it, all we know is the effects afterwards. And apart from Dany's prophetic vision, that's all we really have about why Aenar decided to leave. However, I like the idea that perhaps there's more to it than that. I think it was in Preston Jacobs and Red Team Review's Fire and Blood podcast that it talked about the idea maybe Aenar was banished from court, maybe he did something wrong and he was forcibly exiled. There's nothing really in the text to suggest that anything like that happens, but it would be a very George R. R. Martin thing to do. At the end of the day, most likely it probably was just Danese's vision. Context around Danes' vision is also very vague. Prophetic visions and dreams are a very big part of the main book series and in a lot of George R.R. R. Martin's other work. So I think the question is what kind of dream was this? Was it like a green dream like Bran or something similar to Melisandre's visions in the flames? Being a Targaryen and in Valyria it would kind of fit for it to be a kind of a flame vision. I wouldn't exactly call what Melisandre has a dream, so maybe it's something more along the lines of a green dream like Bran. Honestly, I don't really think it'll have much of an impact in the larger story, but it is another case of prophetic visions and dreams. And not just prophetic visions and dreams, but them actually becoming reality. Now, when it comes to the idea of Aegon visiting Westeros before the conquest, Fire and Blood does basically confirm Aegon and maybe even his sisters had visited Old Town and some other places in Westeros before several times. I mean, the Targaryens had been on Dragonstone for over a hundred years by the time you get to Aegon, and the idea he did step foot in Westeros the first time, the day of the landing, seems to be a belief of the common people, but the idea does play into the whole myth and legend that is Aegon, so maybe it is an idea that Aegon and the Targaryen dynasty as a whole would have encouraged. The whole date of the conquest thing is another area I wanted to go into a lot more detail within the video, but for the sake of time I had to really trim it down to the bare basics. I mean it's easy to assume that dating starts at his landing and not two years later with the second coronation, especially when you see the day be celebrated in the books you think oh so that's what I see. But I do like the idea that Fire and Blood presents that although the second coronation is publicly celebrated, that's the official public holiday, that's the official day of his coronation, the actual landing is still celebrated privately within the Targaryen family. It's kind of like a special day. Two smaller points I want to quickly bring up is the idea of Valerian inbreeding being linked to dragon riding. This is another one of those things that even in the books it's more speculation, but to me it does make sense that it is to do with genetics. Maybe not in the traditional sense because my guess is there's definitely some blood magic at play when it comes to Valyria and dragons. In Fire and Blood there's actually a fair bit of information about how some Targaryens could ride and hatch dragons and some couldn't. Hatching actually seems to be the rarer trait here. Preston Jacobs actually did a really good video on all this. I'll chuck it somewhere in a link but he basically goes through a lot of genetic theory and how it could be linked to dragon riding abilities and could even explain why they eventually died out. So I'm going to jump forward a fair bit now to Arglax's offer of an alliance to Aegon. So he offered his daughter and a lot of land to Aegon as a dowry. The trouble with the offer was the land being offered to Aegon was not Arglax to give, as it had been under the control of House Hall for well over a generation. In the text it's kind of put forward Arglax was offering Aegon this land specifically to create a buffer zone between him and Harren. Clearly Aegon kind of saw through this, which is why he offered Oris instead of himself. Something else I unfortunately had to cut out for time was Aegon naming Oris his strong right hand, which is basically Aegon naming him the first hand of the king. It's something I do intend to go into more detail on when I do a full video about Oris and his life, just I didn't think it was massively important to the story of the actual conquest 
which is why I chose to kind of remove it. But yeah, I will be doubling back and having a proper look at Oris as a whole, and I'll make sure I cover it then. All the Harren Hall and Last Storm stuff is fairly straightforward. The only thing I think probably needs to be brought up is I think it's likely a lot of these events like Crackclaw Point and stuff like that were happening very close or near to the same time as each other. But it's kind of hard to settle on a definitive order. So I just use the order the events are brought up. Again, the Field of Fire, Torrin Stark and Shara Aaron are all fairly straightforward. But something I've always wondered is why the Garners and Lannisters were so surprised by the outcome of the Field of Fire after the events of Harrenhal, after Aegon had already been in battle with Valerian and burnt down this massive castle. Maybe if the Field of Fire hadn't have happened, Torrin Stark would have faced Aegon in battle. For me, this kind of shows that there's so many really good alternate history ideas you could do, much like you can do in the real world. Dawn is something I plan on giving its own video on, or maybe even during the Aegon's Reign videos, because the situation is just so complicated and so different to the other kingdoms. But the short of it comes down to the fact that Dornish were using guerrilla warfare tactics in a land very different to the rest of Westeros. And what can you really do when your enemy won't fight you in open battle? You can keep burning their castles, but what would Aegon have been king of, apart from ashes? Another thing I think is a fact here is Dawn is different in terms of cultures to the rest of Westeros. It reminds me a bit of Moorish Spain, maybe, maybe that was George's inspiration, I don't really know. Aegon's conquest is such an interesting part of the world history because it really is the event that sets motion everything that happens in the main books. Aegon is sort of this mythological figure and over time a lot of the facts get changed and warped so it's hard to really know what actually happened. Fire and Blood and A World of Ice and Fire gave so much more info but what's important to remember is history is written by the victors so is the official history told in these books really what happened or is there a pro-Targaryen bias at play here? So the next videos are probably going to be about Aegon's reign. I've already got the scripts written and looking at those they're probably going to be similar format to these where you've got two kind of like informative videos and then one kind of more kind of light discussion-y talking about things I had to sort of cut. Looking at the scripts the first one is more about his wars and the rebellions he had to deal with during his reign. The second part is more about his politics and kind of more who he was as a person. It also kind of shows the origins of a lot of things like the small council, the King's Guard, and a little bit of the development of King's Landing, how it went from just a little village around the Aegon Fort to what it is now. Once I'm done with the Aegon's Reign videos, I'm probably going to do individual character profiles on Aegon and Rainies. Um, I do intend to do them on Visenya and Oris as well, but because they live longer, I'll probably have to double back and do them after I've done the video about Aegon's sons. If anyone has any suggestions or feedback, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. I have set up a World of Westeros Twitter account and Facebook page if you do want to send me any suggestions or just leave a comment down below. Other than that, I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I hope you enjoyed them. New ones will be coming soon. And I'd really appreciate it if you did subscribe and join me in them. Thanks for watching. Hope I'll see you in the next one.